Gracias eh, por estar todos y todas aquí. Les doy la bienvenida de parte del de Instituto Interamericano para la Investigación del Cambio Global, que en alianza con Plus Climate ha organizado esta conferencia para ustedes en buenas prácticas académicas como ser revisor y editor de una revista científica. Como se han dado cuenta, al ingresar eh, estamos grabando esta conferencia para poderla compartir y por tanto necesitamos su autorización para hacerlo. Le doy ahora la palabra a la doctora Ana Stuart Ibarra, que es directora de ciencia del IAI. Gracias. Gracias, Irene. Bueno, bienvenidos, bienvenidas a, a todos que están aquí presentes. Eh, tengo el agrado de presentar al doctor Jamie Miles, editor ejecutivo de PLOS Climate, eh, revista científica que fue, fue lanzado este año y el próximo año va a salir la primera edición. Y también Laura Francis, editora de investigación asociada de PLOS Climate. Nuestra moderadora, la doctora Evelia Rivera, quien preside el Comité Asesor en Ciencia y Políticas del IAI y quien es profesora del Instituto de Ecología, Pesquerías y Oceanografía del Golfo de México en la Universidad Autónoma de Campeche. Muchísimas gracias a todos eh, y todas que están participando hoy día y esperamos que va a ser una, una discusión muy interesante. Por favor, aprovechan de preguntar eh, las preguntas que les interesa con respecto a buenas prácticas en la revisión de publicaciones científicas y el rol de un editor académico en una revista científica. Muchísimas gracias. Y quiero notar también que esta es la segunda de una serie de talleres que hemos realizado con Post Climate y estamos eh, muy felices con esta colaboración con la revista y esperamos eh, seguir esta, esta conversación con ellos hoy y en futuros eventos. Gracias. Gracias. Eh, le damos la palabra a la doctora Evelia Rivera, que va a ser la moderadora de esta conferencia. Muchas gracias. Eh, es un placer estar con todos ustedes. La verdad es que eh, el IAI ha hecho un gran esfuerzo precisamente para darnos este tipo de instrucción, este tipo de pláticas para nuestro bien. Es eh, muy común que todos los investigadores y todas las personas que deseen eh, participar en las publicaciones de revistas eh, científicas se vean eh, enfrentados a problemas de cómo hacer, qué es lo que se debe de esperar de nosotros como revisores, qué es lo que debemos de hacer, en qué nos debemos de fijar, cuáles son las lecciones que podemos aprender de otras regiones, de otros colegas. Y eso es precisamente lo que esta plática inductoria nos quiere eh, dar a conocer. Es también muy importante porque nosotros como autores podemos aprender también qué es lo que los revisores están fijando, en dónde están los puntos clave que pueden mejorar nuestras publicaciones, sobre todo en aquellas revistas que son eh, angloparlantes o francoparlantes, donde eh, no podemos nosotros tener la certeza en muchas ocasiones de estar abordando las publicaciones desde el punto de vista del lenguaje, de qué es exactamente los puntos que se deben desarrollar, en qué orden, eh, cuáles son las eh, situaciones que debemos subrayar o enfatizar. Y todo esto es parte de esta plática, una plática que, repito, el IAI ha hecho un gran esfuerzo en poner eh, a disposición de todos nosotros para que podamos hacerlo. En el transcurso de la plática, ustedes van a tener la oportunidad de hacer preguntas en el chat. Yo estaré monitoreando todas esas preguntas y estaré viendo cuáles son para que se las esté dando al, al expositor y las pueda contestar. Aquellas preguntas que no puedan ser respondidas por la falta de tiempo, porque estemos ya en tiempo, eh, serán enviadas por correo electrónico y respondidas de esa manera. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros y bienvenidos. Gracias. Pasamos entonces a lo que venimos, a la presentación de Jamie Miles y Laura Francis. Muchísimas gracias nuevamente y eh, la palabra es suya. Thank you very much, um, Irene and Ana and Iberia, for the introduction. It is a real pleasure to be with you all today. 
Um, so thank you um, again to IAI for helping to organize this series of uh, workshops um, together with POS and POS Climate. Um, uh, it's, it's fantastic to be with such a diverse group of people and to um, bring to you hopefully some useful tips um, to inform your experience, um, both as a reviewer and editor, um, but also as Amelia was saying, having a good understanding of, of those two roles and those aspects of the peer review process should also be beneficial for you as an author um, when you're writing and submitting papers too. Um, these things are all different sides of, of, of the same process. So I will just start sharing my screen and um, we'll get started on our presentation. Um, and my colleague Laura and I will be taking it in turns as we work through these slides um, to, to share different perspectives um, on the various aspects of the reviewer and editor role. Um, and in fact, I'm going to hand over to Laura now to get, get us started thinking about um, best practices as a reviewer. So Laura, just let me know when you'd like me to advance slides, um, but otherwise over to you. Thanks, Jamie. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So the first part of our presentation will be discussing some best practices for reviewers. Next slide. So there are a few things to consider before accepting an invitation to review a manuscript. Firstly, do you have time to provide a review? The due date for the review should be provided in the invitation email. Due dates will vary depending on the journal and research area. For PLOS, the review dates are typically between 10 to 30 days. If required, you can request an extension, although this should be in an exception rather than a frequent occurrence. It is also important to consider if you'll be able to reassess a revised version of the manuscript. Secondly, do you have the right expertise? Is the research area or methodology of the manuscript relevant to your own expertise? Feel free to decline to review if you don't believe you have the necessary expertise to provide an assessment of the research. It is also important to consider if you have a competing interest. A competing interest is anything that may interfere with a thorough and objective assessment of a manuscript. It is your responsibility to declare all competing interests and decline to review. If you are unsure if there is a competing interest, you can email the journal office for advice. Common competing interests include a recent or current collaboration with any of the authors. For PLOS, this includes having published with any of the authors in the previous five years, even if the collaboration is not ongoing. Direct competition or a history of scientific conflict with any of the authors, or an opportunity to profit financially from the work. If for any reason you do decline a request to review, it is extremely helpful to editors if you can recommend an appropriate colleague in your place. Although this may not always be possible, particularly if the manuscript is outside of your area of expertise. Journals will often provide helpful resources for reviewers and I've included a link here to our POS1 reviewer guidelines. And Jamie will now discuss further about best practices for providing a review. Thank you, Laura. Um, and at this stage, I just wanted to briefly mention um, one possibility that's worth considering um, as you're undergoing that process of deciding whether or not to take on a review, um, which is so-called co-reviewing. Now, this is when you share the peer reviewer role between yourself and a suitably qualified colleague. Um, usually there'll be another member of your research group, um, often a more junior member of the group, um, or perhaps somebody else within your university department. And co-reviewing can be a good way of pooling expertise and perspectives, and can also be particularly useful in helping to train up or mentor less experienced reviewers among your colleagues. It gives them the chance to get stuck in and benefit from your experience of reviewing um, so that they can understand the process better and, and build their experience. You should, however, check whether the journal for which you're reviewing does have any specific policies or guidelines around co-reviewing before you pursue this option further. But I do think it's something to, to bear in mind and certainly something that we encourage and can help um, explain further on POS journals. OK, um, now I want to get into the nuts and bolts of the process of reviewing a paper itself. And it may sound obvious, uh, but one of the most important things that you need to do as a reviewer is to read the paper and then read it again and maybe again. <laughs> you'll pick up many more nuances on a second reading um, after you've used that first reading to gain a general understanding of the premise of the study and the findings that the authors are presenting. One thing that you may find especially helpful is to sketch out a mirror study of your own 
by which I mean a plan of how you would address the same research question or hypothesis um, that the authors are trying to address. And that can help you to identify any shortcomings or flaws in the approach that the authors have taken and, and really give you a sense of, of whether or not um, they've gone about things in the, the right way. Whenever you're reviewing, you should really try to take on the task with the journal's publication criteria in mind. You should be aware that publication criteria differ substantially between journals and you need to avoid making recommendations that deviate from that journal's policies. So for example, don't suggest rejecting a paper for a lack of novelty if that particular journal doesn't take novelty into account. You should take time to check the article type um, and whether there are any special requirements associated with it. For instance, if the paper is a lab protocol or a methods paper, it won't necessarily contain the same elements as a standard research article would, and you should be using a different set of criteria provided by the journal. You would be surprised how often we see recommendations uh, from reviewers to reject a methods paper that doesn't include uh, results or, or discussion of those. Now, regardless of the study type, you should consider whether the authors have expressed a clear scientific rationale. If the paper is a research article or a protocol, um, you should think about whether the methods are reproducible. Um, it's very likely and hopefully a certainty uh, that the journal will have requirements around reproducibility uh, for any research submitted there. As part of your review, uh, you should also check whether all of the supporting information files and linked data sets um, or resources are available um, and that they do indeed support the arguments made in the paper. So, so be sure to, to dig into those um, and uh, ask for any clarification regarding um, aspects of those files. Often the presentation of supporting files or um, items in repositories um, is not as of higher standard as the manuscript itself. So you may need to um, ask for some, some clarification or improvements in the presentation of those. Now, it may also be that your particular field of research has specific reporting standards that need to be taken into account. So, for example, if the article were to be describing a new species of animal, plant or fungus, then it would need to include certain structured information to comply with international nomenclatural standards. That's just one example, um, but you should check that the authors have met any requirements of that kind that might exist in your particular field. And finally, and most importantly, do allow yourself plenty of time to work through the review of your paper. There will obviously be a deadline associated with the submission of the review, but as Laura's mentioned, you can request an extension of that if needed, um, but do avoid rushing the review process. If you do rush it, you'll be doing a disservice both to the authors and to yourself ultimately. If you need that deadline to be extended, just ask the journal office. The likelihood is that they'll be happy to grant that request, especially given the, the difficulties associated with securing reviewers these days. Right, so now I wanted to say a few things about compiling your comments um, themselves. So first of all, you should check whether the journal requires a particular structure or format to be followed. Um, they'll likely provide guidelines for preparing your comments, which you should read carefully uh, before you start writing your report and then follow so that you can best support the editor in making their decision. Always try to use a neutral, objective tone in the language that you use in your report and try to be as constructive as possible in your comments. Um, try to put yourself in the author's shoes as much as you can. If there are aspects of the study that you really like, please do say so. Um, it's really good and, and important for authors to be made aware of the positives associated with their study. Um, do help the authors to engage with your comments also by presenting them in clear paragraphs or perhaps in bullet points, referring to page numbers in the manuscript. Um, so make sure you have that level of organisation which will allow the authors to relate your comments and criticisms to, to, to the relevant parts of the manuscript. You should be frank about your own limitations as a reviewer and don't try to comment on any aspects of the work that are actually beyond your own expertise. Um, hopefully the academic editor will have secured an additional review from somebody who can cover those aspects of the manuscript that you yourself are not able to comment on. You should also always bear in mind that there's a chance that your reviews might end up being published if the journal offers transparent peer review and the authors have opted in for that. So don't write a review that you wouldn't want to be shared publicly. I think that's something really important to bear in mind um, these days as the adoption of transparent peer review is becoming increasingly widespread among journals and across different research communities. 
Okay, a quick comment on comments uh, to the editor. Um, there may be things that you want to raise to the handling editor's attention without explicitly mentioning them to the authors. And the journal usually provides you with the space to do this um, as part of the, the reviewer form. So for example, if you felt that you as a reviewer um, might have a perceived conflict of interest, uh, but you're not entirely sure, then you should declare that um, for the sake of transparency in the space provided so that the editor could consider that further um, as they're weighing up yours and the other reviewers' comments and reaching their decision. Okay, that concludes our comments on uh, the reviewer role. And I'm gonna hand back to Laura now um, to introduce the section on ed editorial role. Great, thanks, Jamie. So yeah, the second part of this presentation, we'll be discussing some best practices for editors. Next slide, please. So when deciding to accept an invitation as a reviewer, there are similar considerations when accepting to handle the manuscript as an editor. So these include whether you have the right expertise, do you have a competing interest, and do you have time? It is important to consider if you will have time to handle a revised version of the manuscript, as this will likely be assigned back to you when the authors have addressed reviewers' comments. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to go through some core principles for editors with you. Firstly, it's important that you understand your role. There are various editor roles, including guest editors, academic editors, section editors, and these can all vary by journal. So ensure you understand what the journal is asking of you in your editorial role. It's important to promote research ethics and integrity by abiding by the highest standards set by the scientific community should facilitate a peer review without self-interest. This includes avoiding advancement of your own work. Editors should not use their knowledge of potentially competing work to influence timing or editorial judgment and manuscripts. Additionally, editors and reviewers should avoid requests or alluding to citation of their own collaborators or reviewers' work during peer review. There may be times when your work may be a useful resource to authors, However, you should always make it clear to authors that they are not required to cite any recommended work for their manuscript to be published. You should also monitor the ethical behaviour of peer reviewers. We recommend alerting the journal office if you have any concerns of review behaviour, including tone or language of a, re of a review and excessive or irrelevant citation requests by reviewers of their own or your own work. Adhere to confidentiality, don't discuss the research with outside parties before publication. You should exercise your judgment by supporting high quality and timely peer review. Uphold diversity, equality and inclusion. And as we've discussed, editors are responsible for declaring any competing interest and declining to handle the manuscript if there is a competing interest. This includes declaring all institutional and commercial affiliations when you join an editorial board. Next slide, please. Okay, and it's back to me. So thank you, Laura. Now, assuming that um, having gone through the process of uh, deciding whether or not to accept an invitation to handle a manuscript, you are happy to do so and you accept the request, the first thing that you'll need to do um, when that paper is assigned to you as handling editor is to perform an initial assessment to decide whether or not to send it out for peer review. And this evaluation should focus on whether there are obvious fundamental flaws in the scientific rationale or perhaps in the methods that the authors have used and whether the conclusions that they present are actually supported by the data. If you feel that those basic criteria are not satisfied, uh, then you may decide that it's appropriate to reject the paper without further review. Similarly, if the work is clearly redundant with previously published work, then you may wish to decline to consider it further. However, if you are um, happy when you've completed those checks, uh, then the next uh, port of call will be to think about how to go about inviting peer reviewers. So Laura is going to talk through some tips about securing reviewers for, for the paper. Great, so there are a few things to consider when finding reviewers. Firstly, suitable reviewers have expertise in the subject matter and methodology, are actively publishing, are preferably at postdoctoral level or above and are unbiased. Sometimes you may not be able to find a reviewer with expertise that covers both subject matter and methodology. In these types of situations, you may invite multiple reviewers to encompass the necessary expertise on both topic and methods in the submission. 
or if you aren't able to find reviewers to do this, you may be able to conduct your own thorough assessment. We find that inviting your personal connections as reviewers has the best, highest success rate. These can be people that you personally know that have suitable expertise to review the manuscript, or researchers whose work you know from the literature or conferences. The next step to finding suitable reviewers is to conduct a broader search using resources such as PubMed, Google Scholar, Jane, and Web of Science to find articles similar to the submission you're working on. Authors of similar work can be suitable reviewers as their experience is on topic for the manuscript. You can also look at the reference list of the submission. However, you should be mindful of potential competing interests, and this is something to consider when inviting any reviewers. Some journals may have a reviewer database that you can help to find suitable reviewers, but this does vary by journal. Another thing to note is that early career researchers may have more time and appreciate the chance to build their experience of reviewing, so they may be more likely to accept an invitation to review. We recognise that finding and securing reviewers can be the most challenging part of the editor role. It is best to try to be patient, and if you feel you've exhausted your options in finding a reviewer, then reach out to the journal for help. Thank you, Laura. Okay, so assuming that you're successful in securing some reviews for that paper um, and you've now received the reviewers' reports, um, it will be time to, to come to an editorial decision. And as an editor, you should remember that above all, all of your decisions need to be framed with reference to the journal's publication criteria. Um, I know I keep, I keep banging on about publication criteria, um, but it's the framework by which everybody needs to operate in their respective roles within the peer review process in order for things to, to run smoothly. So if your decision does deviate from those criteria, it's very likely the authors will consider that they have grounds for, for appealing. Um, and I'll, I'll come to that uh, a little bit later. If you find yourself looking at so-called split reviews, um, perhaps one review recommending a minor revision and one recommending rejection, then you should consider whether it will be helpful to solicit the perspective of an additional reviewer. Otherwise, you can try to use your judgment to reach a balanced decision, again, focusing on the publication criteria. Sometimes it can be helpful to ask reviewers to clarify aspects of their comments. They may, for instance, make a cursory reference to a potential flaw in the manuscript that you would actually like to know more about. So you should consider asking them to explain that in more detail um, in case that helps you to reach a more uh, considered uh, decision. It's also important to understand the nuances of the options that are available to you as an editor. If you're unsure about whether you should be issuing a, a minor or a major revision, do check the guidelines that the journal provides. Um, they may indicate that minor revisions should be reserved for stylistic or textual edits, as opposed to anything that involves analyses or treatment of data. Um, which may be more appropriate for a major revision. Um, but the timelines and requirements associated with um, the two flavours of, of revision decisions do vary between journals, for better or worse. Right. Now, when you've decided uh, what your decision is going to be, you will then need to prepare a decision letter to communicate that to the authors. And you should try to explain your decision clearly and constructively, um, using the same sort of uh, language related considerations as you would as a reviewer. Remember that you're part of a process that represents a service to the authors as well as to science. You should aim to contextualize the reviews and to point out to the authors which of the reviewers comments actually need to be addressed. Um, it's very common that reviewers uh, provide a long list of criticisms of the manuscript, um, only a subset of which the editor actually considers to be pertinent to ensuring that that manuscript complies with the journal's publication criteria. So you should carefully signal to the authors which edits are actually needed to meet that threshold of compliance with the criteria. If you leave the author to navigate the reviewer's comments unaided, um, it's quite possible that they won't see how they can revise the manuscript to meet the publication criteria. So again, make sure you refer to the criteria wherever appropriate. And as when writing a review, do bear in mind that your decision letter too could end up being published if the authors opt in for transparent peer review. So um, take the time to review the letter carefully before you submit it and before it gets communicated to the authors.
And now, as promised, a very brief note about appeals. Um, it's important to be aware that if your decision is to reject the submission, it may not necessarily be the end of the story. Um, it could be that the authors feel the decision was not in line with the journal's publication criteria, and they may register an appeal. Usually that goes through the journal office before being relayed back to you as the original handling editor. If your decision is appealed, First of all, try not to take it personally. Try to read the author's appeal as objectively as you can and maintain an open mind as to whether the paper should be reconsidered. However, if you do need to stand by your decision, if you're confident that you made the right call and it was consistent with the publication criteria, then of course you should do so and explain that calmly and clearly to the authors. And before we wrap up, I just wanted to very briefly mention that being a journal editor is not all about handling manuscripts. There are many other activities in the life of the journal that you can be involved in, including the development of policies, the curation of calls for papers or special issues, and outreach or social media activities. As an editor, you are an ambassador for the journal in your community, and you will help to build and maintain its reputation over time. You'll also be called on to feed into the journal strategy as it evolves over time, and you can help to set the agenda for focused topics and areas of growth. So there are many other opportunities for um, meeting colleagues on the editorial board, working with different people across the, the journal staff and the publisher staff um, to, to um, make the most of your experience. And I'm just going to briefly hand back to Laura, um, who's going to point out some useful resources um, that you can uh, yeah, so we've included some links here to our PLOS Peer Review Centre and PLOS Climate Resources for Editors. So these pages include resources that have information about the things we've discussed today in this presentation and some further information. So if you're interested, please check those out. We'll be sharing the presentation slides with you all so you'll also have access to these links from there. And that's all for us. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll hand back over to Avelia and um, we'll be very happy to answer any questions that you might have on anything that we've talked about during our presentation or any other aspects of uh, the reviewer or editor roles that we might have missed. So thank you again. Muchísimas gracias a Jamie y Laura. Eh, es, fue una presentación muy clara y muy precisa de lo que como revisores y editores eh, estaríamos haciendo para que un paper pueda salir a la luz publicado. Eh, estamos esperando sus preguntas. La primera es, would you have some cases or examples that you can share? Por favor. Tal vez Ricardo puede especificar ejemplos de qué. Ejemplos de eh, un proceso de, desde el perspectiva del editor o el proceso de revisar una publicación. Tal vez Ricardo puedes agregar en el chat algo más a qué te refieres con ejemplos. Bueno, mientras tenemos otra pregunta, es un comentario con una pregunta. Recently, I had an invitation to peer review an article, but I declined. Since then, I feel like I have burned a few bridges. Do you have any tips to reject review invites? So I can uh, weigh in on this briefly. And then if Laura, you would like to add anything, then please feel free to, to jump in. Um, so yes, these days it being very difficult for editors to secure reviewers for papers, um, it can be frustrating to, to receive um, uh, very many declines from potential reviewers who are invited. Um, however, I think if as somebody who's being approached um, as a potential reviewer, um, but, but you're not able to, to take on that assignment, um, the, the most important thing you can do is to be 
honest, um, obviously to be polite uh, as usual, um, but just be clear about the reasons for why you're not able to take on that commitment. Um, I'm assuming that in many cases um, it's going to be because people are simply too busy. Um, everybody who uh, works in one way or another in peer review or in publishing will understand that um, as a, a very a reasonable explanation uh, for not being able to take on that role. Um, so I think provided you're, you're upfront and, and clear about that reason, um, I, I wouldn't imagine that that's going to cause any kind of personal um, animosity that's going to linger for very long. Um, the one thing that I would say just to add to that is that there are of course particular areas of research which are very specialised um, and where there is a relatively small pool of reviewers out there who may be qualified to comment on, an, on a particular paper. Um, and I do think that um, in those sorts of areas of research um, it can be more difficult um, to um, either be somebody who's in that position of having to decline a review or to be an editor who's trying to find somebody, the whole thing can be much more complicated when there is a very limited pool of people to choose from or to be involved. Um, I don't have a silver bullet answer for, for that, um, but I think ensuring that everybody who is involved bears that in mind at least and is, is aware that this is um, a difficulty that everybody involved is having to consider and, and, and to face um, is important and, and just trying to be considerate about other people's time, um, other people's availability um, and, and working together to, to try to find a solution. Uh, I'm afraid I can't, I can't provide anything more concrete than that. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. Laura would like to add anything. Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add is um... If you are declining to review, if you know of anybody who may be suitable to review, you can suggest other people that the editor could then contact to review. Or if you don't have time yourself, maybe one of your postdocs or PhD students may be able to help. Um, that can be suitable for some journals as long as you read over their review and check that you also agree with their comments. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Laura. Now we have another one from Nesto Ricardo Bernal Suarez. What's the main suggestion in order to achieve an equilibrium of this revision process? So by, by equilibrium, um, I'm assuming that, that um, we're talking about coming to a balanced decision based on potentially conflicting comments from, from different reviewers. Yes, um, I think so. Okay, so I, I think, um, first of all, having a good understanding of who the reviewers are and what the reviewer's own expertise and experience is, is very important um, because it could well be that those reviewers are coming at the paper, if you like, from very different places, um, potentially uh, due to their own uh, differences in their own expertise. Perhaps one of them uh, is able to engage very deeply with the the methods or the, the analyses that are being performed on the data and another is more familiar with the wider context of the subject area and it could be that there are actually problems with the paper which pertain specifically to um, the way that the statistical analyses have been performed, the way the data has been treated, um, whereas there are no particular issues with the way the study as a whole is framed and related to the wider literature. So having that awareness of uh, why it might be that the authors have very different, sorry, the reviewers have very different perceptions um, of the quality of the paper and any problems that there might be with it um, is a good starting point. Um, moving on from there, um, when you're thinking about then um, distilling that into a, a decision, um, as I've repeatedly said, I think um, bearing in mind that the publication criteria of the journal is a, usually the most useful way of approaching this. Um, so picking apart the criticisms that, that the individual reviewers have, have provided you with and seeing, seeing if you can fit those into the framework of the journal publication criteria. Um, it may be that you find that uh, the reviewer who is more positive about the paper um, hasn't um, kind of framed their comments in, in a way that, that really engages with the criteria, um, whereas the more critical reviewer um, is picking up on things that really do clearly tally with um, specific aspects of, of, of the criteria. And that may make it easier then for you as an editor to err on the side of, of, of that more uh, negative reviewers comments and uh, make a decision accordingly. Um, but I think, again, giving yourself the, the time and 
the space um, to think about the, the two or three sets of comments um, in parallel um, and against the publication criteria um, will help you to, to reach a considered judgment. And you, of course, can inflect all of this with your own experience, um, because, of course, you should hopefully have taken on this assignment as an editor because you felt at least reasonably um, familiar with the subject area and that you would be able to um, uh, be in a position to, to come um, to a considered judgment um, based on your own experience supplemented by the reviewers' reports. I hope that helps. Thank you very much. Why has it become so much harder for journals to secure reviewers? I think there are many reasons for this. I don't know if, Laura, would you like to, to jump in with any initial comments on, on this? Or should I go ahead? Um, you can start and I'll add. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, lo lots of reasons here. I, I, I mean, one thing is, is the sheer prol the proliferation of the literature. Um, there are many more journals out there now. There are many more editorial boards, many more papers being published as a whole. Um, and, and therefore the total number of potential reviewer assignments in existence has, has increased. Um, and that's not necessarily um, uh, you know, being um, matched by an increase in the workforce that's available, the volunteer workforce available to carry out those reviews. So that's one thing um, based on manpower, if you like. Um, alongside that, I think there has not been necessarily enough um, systematic effort on the part of institutions, universities and so on to provide um, solid training and mentoring for um, students and, and um, early career researchers who need to build up their experience of reviewing. Um, so I think there's a kind of cultural dimension here as well. Um, that's one of the things that we're very interested in as a, a journal at PLOS Climate and as a publisher at PLOS in, in doing what we can to um, support the development of, of early career researchers and indeed graduate students in building their familiarity and confidence in engaging with peer review. Um, so I think those, those are a couple of, of major elements involved here. Um, but there are, there are very many reasons why, um, why people are being stretched in all sorts of different directions in academia these days and, and just find themselves um, increasingly um, uh, unable to take on additional commitments. And we recognize that very much um, at PLOS and, and always try to, to be as flexible as we can in supporting um, those while recognizing that at the same time, we're trying to, to provide that service to, to the authors in as timely a manner as possible. So it's a very difficult situation and there are no, no easy answers for, for making everybody's lives um, easier, um, but um, we, we certainly are trying to try to work towards um, that as best as we can. Laura, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I'd just like to add that we've also really noticed over the past two years, um, reviewers have been highly affected by the pandemic, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, with competing uh, priorities of like childcare and other research priorities as well. So people just have less time to review at the moment. And this effect is still ongoing. Um, we see it a lot in our review of decline reasons that people are just too busy at the moment. Um, and as Jamie said, it's, it's a difficult situation. It's something that we're trying to find solutions for, but nobody has any answers at the moment. Thank you very much. Some, are possi some possibility is to have a letter of recognition of uh, precisely what the process has been done by the researcher or the reviewer, I mean, and then that will help for the evaluation that we researchers have to pass every single year. So uh, an acknowledge, a thank you letter would help a lot. Uh, another question is, a reviewer, should you act as a reviewer, should you act differently if you are reviewing for a prestigious journal compared to a lesser impact one? Should you be more or less strict based on this? Does this happen? Okay, so um, with regards to differences between journals, um, I think as a reviewer, you should, um, always focus on the, the guidelines that the journal has provided and the criteria that the, the journal selects papers on. Um, of course, there are going to be you know, cultural considerations around different journals and um, different perceptions of, of journals prestige, but those 
in and of themselves should not affect the way that you go about your process as a reviewer. You should be approaching things as objectively as possible um, and, and really only taking into consideration um, the framework that the journal has provided you with for carrying out the review. Um, so I know it can be very difficult to try to eliminate those um, considerations associated with prestige and so on um, from your mind when, when you're trying to in, engage with um, the peer review process. Um, but it's really important that you, you try to do that um, and recognize that your role as a reviewer is to assess the, the quality of the science. You're not making a judgment as to how exciting it is or um, what impact factor journal it should end up in. Um, that's, that's not um, for, for you to, to comment on as a reviewer. And if I could just very briefly go back to the point um, that, that was mentioned before regarding recognition for reviewers, because I think this is a very important matter. Um, and, you know, review, reviewers, generally speaking, at least, um, are doing this on a voluntary basis um, and traditionally have not received very much um, direct or indirect recognition um, for the considerable amount of time and effort that they expend on this. Um, and I think, again, there is increasing um, awareness that, that um, there needs to be a shift in the way that we talk about um, the reviewer role and the way that we recognize the contribution that reviewers make to um, the publishing process. Um, and so um, publishers and journals um, are very much looking for ways in which they can more formally recognize what reviewers are doing. This is not necessarily going to take the form of financial compensation. I'm just putting that out there straight away. Um, however, there are other ways in which um, reviewers' contributions can be recognized. You mentioned that the possibility of some kind of certification, and there are many online portals now. Um, some of you will be familiar with Publons, for instance, where you can um, log the, the reviews that you submit to, to different journals and, and have a formal record of that, um, which may then form part of the, the research assessment process um, in your institutional or, or national context. Um, and there are many other initiatives and schemes out there which are um, being developed specifically aimed at trying to provide more recognition, both for reviewers and for editors as well, um, uh, in response to, to the significant contribution that they make to, to the publishing process as a whole. Thank you, Jamie. There is a question in Spanish. ¿Qué sucede cuando son revistas profesionales, por ejemplo, de la IFCC, cuando quieren buscar revisores? En mi profesión hay muy poco, hay muchos colegas que no son postdoc, ni tantos con un PhD, muchos son masters. This is a very good point. Um, I think in those more specialized journals, um, which will be more familiar with the um, particular areas of industry um, that, that are pertinent to the scope of that journal, it's likely that the journal will have um, at least an internal policy regarding who they consider to be suitably qualified to review a manuscript submitted to that journal. And if you were, as an editor, a member of the editorial board, handling a submission to that journal and you were unsure as to whether a potential reviewer did meet um, whatever internal requirements the, the journal office had, had identified. The best thing you, you can do is always just to, to check with the journal staff as to um, what their particular criteria might be. Um, and this is actually, as it happens, something that we are thinking about um, quite a lot on PLOS Climate and some of the other new PLOS journals, um, where our scopes cover certain areas where we, we feel like um, a lot of the research that happens is being carried out by people who work in industry as opposed to in an academic context. And so we're actually in the process of, of trying to develop some new um, criteria and, and new guidelines for how we go about um, handling the, the review process when it is going to involve people coming from a range of different backgrounds um, as opposed to the kind of traditional um, academic context. Um, but as I say, for, for more specialized journals, um, I would hope that, um, that they would have um, some sort of framework in place for being able to answer those kinds of questions. Thank you, Jamie. Could you give some recommendations in order to promote papers with advances in climate research? Um, so I guess this is in regards to um, promoting papers once they have been published. Um, 
um, if I've interpreted that correctly, um, then many journals will have um, a dedicated um, program um, geared towards the promotion of newly published content. So, for example, at PLOS, we have our editorial media team um, who are specifically responsible for preparing press releases for new papers, for sharing news about our new publications with um, uh, various uh, press syndicates in, in, in different regions and, and uh, groups of journalists interested in different disciplines. Um, so the journal itself, or, or the publisher at least, will have its own mechanism for disseminating research in that way. Um, there will also be opportunities to work with the journal on a social media strategy um, for, for disseminating the work. Um, most journals will have a, a Twitter account, perhaps LinkedIn, or some other venue through which they're able to, to share news of new publications. Um, so my top recommendation would always be to try to work closely with the journal itself and leverages, leverage its resources as opposed to trying to do all of the legwork yourself as an author, because it can take a lot of time to to try to prepare um, your own uh, press documentation and, and, and your own social media. Um, it's much better if you can to, to make use of the resources that the, the publisher was likely to have to help you with that. Um, and of course, they'll be very interested to, to um, get your own um, uh, views on the press release and so on too. So um, do, do talk to them first. Thank you. In Espanol. ¿Qué se puede recomendar para publicaciones no exactamente para una revista en el ámbito de publicaciones científicas que no son académicas? Evela, si puedes apagar tu micrófono. Esta, sí. ¿Qué se puede recomendar para publicaciones no exactamente para una revista en el ámbito de publicaciones científicas que no son académicas. So I'm, I'm not going to be enormously well qualified to comment on this with all of my own personal experience um, being specific to academic journals um, and to um, the, the context um, in which we operate. Um, but what I can say is that um, many of the uh, sorts of publication criteria and many of the uh, processes involved in peer review um, for a scientific journal will be at least broadly equivalent to um, the evaluation process that may exist um, at a, a less academic uh, venue. Um, so, th so that process of um, receiving potentially anonymized feedback um, and then incorporating revisions um, is likely to be very similar. Um, the exact way that that operates is going to, of course, depends on um, whether we're talking about um, some other type of, of, of non-traditional journal or whether this is more of a, um, a white paper or um, some other um, indus industrial report, for instance. Um, the, the nuance of, of, of those processes will always be different, but I think many of the core principles that Laura spoke about in relation to um, the, the sort of editorial oversight of the um, assessment and, and indeed the preparation of those sorts of, of reports and papers um, will apply equally. Um, so, so the same kinds of considerations around clarity of communication, um, around assessment with, regard, with respect to um, a set of, uh, of publication criteria of one kind or another, um, and of thinking about um, publication ethics and conflicts of interest, all these kinds of things apply equally um, to, to many different contexts. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, in Spanish, la revisión en ciego sigue vigente frente a las nuevas tendencias de la revisión abierta? Yeah, so um, there is a diversity of um, review, peer review models out there now, um, many, many different types. Um, and there's been kind of a gradual overall move towards um, more transparent peer review um, overall. And that's not to say that certain journals and publishers haven't moved in the other direction um, towards increasingly anonymized review processes. Um, and there are different arguments in favor of different models. So some people see a so-called double blind review in which um, both the reviewers and the authors have their um, identities um, 
anonymized um, as being um, more impartial, less biased. Um, um, however, um, at PLOS, we've tended to, to, to gravitate towards an increased level of transparency in which we opt to um, at least offer the authors uh, the choice of having the entire peer review history published alongside their, their accepted manuscript, um, which means that the reviewers' reports and the academic editors' decision letters uh, will be published alongside the article. Um, and readers will then be able to reconstruct the process by which the paper was revised um, and improved through the peer review process. And we actually see that going back to, to what we were talking about a little bit earlier uh, in terms of recognition of, of peer reviewers. Um, we see the publication of those reviewers' reports as another mechanism by which we can shine a light on the contributions that reviewers are making to um, the um, increased uh, the increased uh, reliability, reproducibility and rigour of the science that we're publishing. Thank you, Jamie. If you choose to pass a longer review to a PhD or postdoc that you will then look over, I assume it's important to let the journal know that you plan to do this or is this an accepted practice? Laura, do you want to, to jump in on that? Yeah, so um, it does vary by journal. For PLOS journals, if it's a postdoc that you don't have to let us know, um, we often invite postdocs as reviewers, that's completely fine. If they are a PhD student, we do ask that you tell us um, that that is happening and that you make sure that you've read over the review yourself. Um, but as I said, it does vary by journal. So check with the journal that you are an editor for and they'll be able to help you with more information on that. Thank you, Laura. Can you share the link of the platform to share your reviews? Sorry. Um, yes, we, we will share um, a variety of, of links after this meeting, um, including the slides that, that we used in the presentation. Um, and there'll be lots of resources there which will be useful um, for understanding more about how the peer review process work at PLOS. And there are also some more general resources for supporting you, um, which should um, stand you in good stead, regardless of, of which journal or, or publisher you're engaging with. So we'll make all of that available after the workshop. Well, we are almost ending the time. Um, we'll be curated after the event, the non-related questions. Uh, good, thank you very much to share these advice and recommendations, Jamie, Laura, it had been very helpful. I am um, sure that this has been very helpful for everybody. Uh, any last comments that you might be adding for all of us? Um, I would just um, go back to, to what I've been harking on about all along, which is my key takeaway is to always think about publication criteria. I know I sound like a broken record, um, but I do think that's the, the answer to most questions about the peer review process. Um, so keep that in mind. Otherwise, um, all I would say is thank you very much again for your time today. It's been a pleasure to, to be able to talk to everybody and to answer some of your questions. We'll be very happy to answer more um, as a follow up to the workshop uh, by email. So um, please feel free to, to get in touch via IAI or directly with PLOS Climate at any stage. Um, we'd be very happy to hear from you. And uh, thank you to Laura as well for, for joining today and helping to deliver the presentation. Gracias, Jamie. Gracias, Laura, el día de hoy por compartir su sabiduría, sus conocimientos. Eh, como avisaron, vamos a hacer un seguimiento y vamos a compartir todos los links del conocimiento con ustedes. Eh, nuestro interés es que vayamos como región mejorando en el ámbito académico, eh, produciendo mejores publicaciones científicas, actuando como editores académicos de calidad, que es lo que esperan eh, las revistas. Y eh, le voy a dar la palabra a la doctora Ana Stuart Ibarra, la directora de ciencia del IAI, para que cierre formalmente la conferencia. Bueno, solo para agradecer a Jamie, Laura, Evelia, 
eh, por su participación en este evento de hoy y a todos y todas que participaron. Me pareció una excelente discusión, muchísimas preguntas y muchísima interacción. Eh, agradezco esta, este espacio. Vamos a compartir las grabaciones y esperamos poder seguir colaborando con PLOS para realizar otros eventos futuros para esta comunidad. Entonces también Uh, si tienen ideas eh, o sugerencias de temáticas o talleres que les interesan, por favor, pueden contactarse con el IAI. Estaríamos felices de, de conversar y ver cómo podemos ir apoyando a la comunidad eh, científica de las Américas.